Christ. My name is Rumi Khan, and I'm a junior at New Yorkshire High School. Just want to talk about myself before I get going. Um, I was born in Virginia, moved to Michigan, now I live in Delaware, so as you can see it was quite a change from Virginia and Michigan, but um, mm -hmm. I've grown and adapted. <laughs> so, um, um, however, I've seen Michigan, I've seen Virginia, and I've seen lots of states in this country. And I can say that I'm extremely proud to be an American Muslim based on that. So that's what we'll be talking about today. So as an American Muslim, I've inherited two great traditions. The tradition of uh, being an American and the tradition of being a Muslim. And also of being American first. And I'm sure most people in this room have had experience with that, considering where we are right now. But I don't really need to go into a depth, depth why, I, why I'm proud of my American heritage. See, the United States was mainly founded by immigrants, whether it was forced or not. And these strong democratic values that permeated the very, the very founding of this nation gave birth to civil liberties. And, and um, it's created the republic that we cherish so ideally today. These personal freedoms, religious tolerance, and scientific innovations have always been part of America's heritage. And they're things I can be proud of. They also complement my other form of inherited, of inherited heritage, which is my Islamic tradition that I have inherited. So, um, I'm not going to quote in scripture today, but I will talk about it, a little bit about history. So, um, so uh, let me just give you a crash course in why. So, there's this myth that perpetuates a lot of history that after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, you know, uh, the world went through a horrible dark age where there was no intellectual learning, no scientific growth, no philosophical production. But that is simply not true. While the torch of Western civilization may have been snuffed out by the occasional Attila the Hunt, it was picked up and carried by another civilization that appeared slightly used to it, which was Islamic civilization. From the 800s to 1200s saw what was known as the Islamic Golden Age, wherein the Islamic empires and states channeled Indian and Greek texts together and produced knowledge and science that only furthered what the ancients had built upon. For example, as, as just in the early 800s themselves, the, the fifth caliph famously built what was known as the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, which was a building where scholars from all over the land, from Mali, from Samarkand, from India, from the Byzantine Empire, could come and read and translate texts so everyone had access to the knowledge of the ancients. What this gave birth to was an incredible growth of knowledge and science in the Middle Ages. For example, um, you know the scientific method? That's pretty important to you know everything science is about. That was invented by a man named Ibn Hajim, who lived in Egypt. He was a Muslim, but contributed. Um, he was also a philosopher, and uh, interestingly enough, you know the term Renaissance man applies to people like Leonardo da Vinci. A synonym of that is what's known as a polymath, which is a person who does a lot of things that are good at science, good at philosophy, people like Aristotle, people like Ibn Hajim. And another person who's um, a famous polymath from this era was named Umar Khayyam, who, um, who basically designed what we call algebra. Like, ever notice why it's called algebra? Al is the Arabic word for, I believe, the algebra. So, clearly, there is a foundation of science and learning. And Omar Khayyam himself identified what was known as the Mutazalite, which, which was a Muslim who believed that logic, reasoning, and rationality was supreme in our interpretation of the world in a religious context. Now, the idea of scientific empiricism ruling over, at least ruling over the way we should do things scientifically, it is something that should seem familiar because that's what was very key for what was known as the Enlightenment in Europe. And the same Enlightenment was the one that built this country, at least that's what our founding fathers drew their sources from, like John Locke. So this is why, this is why I identify not as American and a Muslim, but as an American Muslim, which has access to both of those traditions to pull from. So Islam has had a very strange history in the United States. It's the third most popular religion if you combine all the forms of Christianity and Judaism into just one little monolith, which is, of course, ridiculous. But, I mean, if you do that, then yes, Islam is the third most popular religion. Only 1% 1, 1 of the country is Muslim. So, um, for example, 10% of all slaves that were forcibly brought to the United States were Muslim. And they did leave their impact. For example, there was an incident where one Islamic scholar who studied at Timbuktu was captured after a battle and brought here. But he still studied the Quran, and he still contributed to the intellectual to the intellectual development of the United States. What's most fascinating about Islam and the history of the United States is within the context of religious freedom. So when we were designing the Constitution and they were determining whether or not to include, you know, the, the clause about religious freedom, 
some people opposed it, saying, oh, God forbid a, a Muslim or a, of a Catholic becomes president. Like, that would be the worst. So, so the Founding Fathers had to sit down and decide, okay, how far should this religious freedom go? Will we only give it to Protestants, or will we let a Catholic or Muslim be, a pres be the president? Of course, the, of course, we've already had both. We have John F. Kennedy who's Catholic, and Barack Hussein who's Muslim, right? <laughs> Okay, it fell flat. It happened. <laughs> okay, I tried. I tried. So, but it should be known that Islam was not entirely foreign to the United States. Like, for example, I believe the Supreme Court has them listed as one of the uh, law bringers, along with them, um, along with I believe other presidents and, of and people in Western uh, history. John Adams himself called him a soberer inquirer of the truth. It's quite an interesting quote, considering it was in the 1700s. Um, and perhaps the one, the biggest connection, which is something we should take to heart today, was um, uh, the United States signed what was known as the Treaty of Tripoli with um, some barbarous states like Tunis and Algeria in the uh, 1780s. That basically, within the treaty, there was a clause saying that um, that the United States had no enmity against the laws, religion, and tranquility of Muslims. Literally since the first few decades of this country, we had made our peace with the Muslims and said, you know what, you, if, you, if you somehow do it, you can become president. And we have no enmity against you. In fact, the very first country to recognize the United States as being a proper independent country was the Sultanate of Morocco in 1777, which recognized our country, even though we, we did not share the same uh, majority religion. So, and of course, this is one of the longest treaties that's still been in effect, even to this day. So today, Muslims in America have the unique opportunity that they inherit two great traditions. The Islamic tradition, whether it be knowledge, theology, religion, and the American tradition, one that stresses civil liberties, religious tolerance, democracy, equality for all. These are two great values that, that you know, can really make you proud. And, and, you know, this goes to show, like, Pew polls have found that on average, American Muslims are 6% more satisfied than the United States with the United States than Americans themselves, the majority. And um, most of Americans are more likely to believe than the average American that if you work hard, you can succeed in life, which is considered one of the main tenets of the American dream, of course. There are many important Muslims in the political arena, like Muhammad Ali, you know, famous boxer, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, Reza Aslan, Fareed Zakaria, both important authors, DJ Khalid, you know, and of course, Malcolm X, who is uh, very important for civil rights. So, I mean, unlike Europe, where a lot of things happened, the United States has proved far more tolerant to its Muslim Americans, where Muslims rarely report being politically marginalized or significantly impactfully discriminated against to the point where it ruins their lives. The United States has been relatively good to Muslims. And I, and I, and I like to report, and I do qualify this by saying I'm a male, I have personally never received a single case of discrimination against me for being Muslim in my entire 17 years of being in the United States. Which I think is pretty impressive for any minority to say. I, and that, that's why I can proudly say that I am an American Muslim. So later Obama, you know, um, uh, I believe this year said, he told American Muslims that you shouldn't be forced to choose between being an American or being a Muslim. And I can say I'm not forced to choose between being an American and a Muslim. Because I choose the American Muslim path. Because I'm proud to be an American and I'm proud to be a Muslim. Thank you.